Welcome to Slash Forward, the channel where we provide summarization and commentary on all your favorite popular and obscure horror movies. In this video, we're going to run through a brief synopsis of the 2014 film Housebound. Based in New Zealand and produced on a low budget, this movie manages to put a semi-modern spin on the classic ghost infestation storyline. The story unfolds at the main character's childhood home, which appears to have only caught up technologically to 1997, providing the film with copious amounts of nostalgia and charm, as you'll soon see. The movie starts with Kylie and a friend rolling into an empty parking lot at night. We quickly learn they're here for some dark business, hopping out quickly, equipped with heavy tools as they approach an ATM. We get a cool shot from the security camera, giving us the feeling that we're about to watch an instant karma compilation, which is confirmed when the guy hammers away at the ATM with questionable form. Undeterred, Kylie, without bothering to move the body to the car first, lights an explosive and blows the ATM wide open. She grabs the loot and hauls it and her partner back to the car, wasting precious minutes as the alarm sounds. We get a Fast and Furious style series of quick edits as she revs up to take off, but then are treated to a Fast and Furious in real life outcome when her ricer gets hung up on a speed bump. Seriously? You should see how it sticks to the road in a hairpin. As the following scenes unfold, we hear about substance abuse issues and discover she's been through several treatment programs already. They still consider her a candidate for rehabilitation, but feel she would have a better chance of success in a stable environment. So they sentence her to eight months of house arrest. Now housebound, she's brought to the estate by her overseer, Amos. As she prepares herself for what's to come, they get rear-ended by her absent-minded mother. I think that there's more damage to mine, though, than there is to yours. She learns the rules of the anklet, they test the range, and then she finds herself at an awkward family Reunion. Is that one of those iPhones? No. It's flash, isn't it? Not really. See that, Graham? Kylie's got one of those iPhones. It's not an iPhone. We learn that Graham isn't much of a conversationalist. I was just saying to Kylie Graham, the wee Mary girl who gave Kylie a ride home, she's very nice. But Miriam is desperate to speak. If no one engages, she fills the void with mindless chatter. Brief establishing shots show a staring contest with the creepy neighbor, and that Kylie's prepaid phone has run out of minutes. That evening, Miriam, still talking, calls into a radio show discussing paranormal activity, and tells the host about disturbances she's experienced. My every hair on my body was standing upright, and I turned around, and I saw this thing disappear back into the darkness. Kylie overhears her mom's creepypasta account of a basement encounter. When Kylie mocks her for this, Miriam points out that Kylie used to complain of experiences as well. She just doesn't remember them in the same way. Before bed, Kylie demonstrates the overwhelming power that kegels can grant to one's pelvic floor as she stops and starts urinating in an attempt to better make out an odd noise she hears. The next morning, Kylie boots up the old family computer, which winds itself up like a turbine and spits out some classic dial-up modem noises before exploding from the stress of normal operation. With nothing better to do, Kylie ventures into the basement to look for something interesting, but only finds some books with Sunshine Grove stamps in them. Still bored, she takes to staring out the window and sees her caseworker standing awkwardly in the drive, staring back at her. As he begins to therapy her, we discover that part of her emotional state is the result of her father walking out on them and starting a new family elsewhere. Later on, Miriam comes home with what appears to be the week's dinner in the form of a 30-pound sack of potatoes. She finds the house in a mess, Kylie lazily lying about, and the evening's meatloaf eaten. What a brat. Kylie falls asleep in front of the TV. A brief interruption of the light patterns causes her to stir. She fully wakes when she hears the computer loudly chugging away. It appears to now be functional, in whatever sense that word applies here. Confused but not willing to risk a brownout, she powers it down. She goes to bed but is disturbed by some odd baby noises, followed by her phone going off. She goes off in pursuit of the noise and finds herself in the basement. In an unfortunate series of events, the lights go out. She's attacked by Jesus, her anklet goes off, and a hand grabs her. She brings her mom downstairs, but she's not having it. Then they both hear a noise. They go to investigate, finding evidence that someone's in the house. Kylie gets a jump on the intruder, beating him about the head and neck with a family heirloom. She's about to go for the kill shot, but is robbed of this forbidden pleasure when we discover that it's Amos coming to check on the ankle signal. We find out that he lives in the neighborhood, allowing quick responses such as this. Apparently promoted to detective, Amos begins to examine the house for evidence of the intruder. The ladies eventually come clean, confirming that they actually believe they were victims of a supernatural disturbance. Luckily, Amos is both a detective and an aficionado of the paranormal. He whips out his recorder, gives Kylie the finger, and asks several questions of the vengeful spirit. They don't initially hear anything, but Amos plays it back. The scene unfolds with tense expectation. Is there anyone here today you want to communicate with? Somebody's gonna 
but leads nowhere. Don't worry. I'll uh, run it through a filter when I get home. Yeah, of course. With the readers, loggers, and transmogrifiers all in place, Amos shares his strategy for verifying and managing the ghost problem, while Kylie shares hers. I'm gonna smash it in the face. That night, Kylie's distracted by the sound of odd voices in her room. She rolls over to find a possessed New Zealand version of Teddy Ruxpin talking that devil's talk and seemingly taunting Kylie. <laughs> She responds in a way that calls into question how the Child's Play series lasted more than five minutes. While there are perfectly reasonable explanations for this event, there are less so for this. The sole member of the New Zealand Paranormal CSI unit checks the scene, apparently looking for pupil dilation. He confirms he didn't see anything on the video, but also says that it's hard to review hours and hours of footage. This leads to a role reversal as Kylie is now convinced that something supernatural is afoot. While Amos is convinced, she's alleviating her boredom by messing with him. Later, Kylie attempts to relax in her room, but is disturbed by a creaky door. She reasonably manages this situation only to be taunted by a smaller, creakier door leading to a crawl space in her closet. It's filled with knickknacks, including a box of childhood memories. She briefly channels Fosse as she takes a drag off her cigarette and proceeds to twirl herself into a jump scare. Graham needs someone to hold half the heirloom that she previously broke while the glue sets. Not a huge deal. How long can it take? Ah, balls! Graham takes this opportunity to open up to Kylie. As the discomfort mounts, Kylie tries to change the subject. The end result of Graham's unsuccessful negotiation of this conversation has him accidentally revealing that the house was not previously a bed and breakfast, as Miriam had claimed. In response to this, Kylie does a more thorough review of the contents of the basement, most of which was left behind by the prior owner, and discovers that Sunshine Grove was a halfway house for troubled youths, one of whom had been brutally murdered in the home. She confronts Miriam about raising her in a house where someone was murdered in her room, but Miriam responds with indignation. When you start working and you have to pay bills of your own, we'll see how quick you are to snub your nose at a bargain. As Kylie continues her research, she discovers the girl in question was beaten, stabbed repeatedly, and bitten. Feeling it's safe to assume that this is the spirit occupying the house, Amos turns turns this into a Scooby-Doo adventure. And now we know, a murdered girl who needs our help. With murder. Kylie, however, is not convinced. She attempts to find a way out of the house. Unfortunately, the odds of a transfer are minimal, unless, of course, she poses an immediate danger to herself or others. And she demonstrates her inherent danger by smacking her snack tray and mangling the wire drying rack. No one buys it, though, so she storms off. As the discussion continues without her, the lights go out. Miriam goes off into the darkness to test the breakers. As she works on it, we get a quick flash of a disturbing ghost standing behind Dennis. Creepy for sure, but fairly standard in terms of ghosts. Uh, okay, that helps. The police come, and we surmise they suspect Kylie. They try to sort out the details. Mr. McRandall was attacked by a vengeful ghost. Yes. Right out. But they don't get far. Kylie's had it. She takes off no regard for the authority of the magistrate. Amos rolls up and appeals to her sense of empathy <gasps> by reminding her the ghost is just a girl who needs help and convinces her to try connecting with the spirit and just listening. Now, more centered and connected with her third eye, Kylie returns to the basement to see what the spirit world has to confide. A noise travels through the house above her and settles in the non-functional furnace. She reaches in and retrieves a nasty old dental plate. Ugh, it's hairy. Then her phone goes off again, so she heads upstairs in pursuit. As she hears more noises, she connects the presence of the partials in the furnace to the vent in her room and checks it out. She finds a memory box with some contraband and old jewelry. Kylie reviews these new developments with Amos. Her working hypothesis is that the girl was stealing from the neighbors. One of them caught her, confronted her, absolutely lost his shit, and murdered her. In the confusion of the biting and stabbing, the dental plate was lost in the jewelry was forgotten. Her first suspect is the skanky neighbor who's known for violent outbursts and strange smells coming off of his property. Amos isn't so sure, feeling they need stronger evidence before they- Ah, bingo! This escalates quickly as Kylie convinces Amos to break into his house during the day while he's sleeping. Kylie makes her way in after lucking out and uncovering the spare key resting between two coolers. She enters the home and discovers that he lives as we would expect, like no one else. Brody. Not finding him in bed, she goes to poke around and finds him in repose on his recliner. She goes for it, really digging in there, trusting that he's blackout level napping. The plate pops out into the refuse filling the room and she has no choice but to run. As they flee, Amos gets stuck in a coon trap, so Kylie covers him and continues on. Seeing the neighbor lumber by with a rifle, he calls Kylie at home to warn her. She heads for the basement, grabs some shears, and hides in the closet. She hears footsteps approaching the door, readies herself, and when the door opens, she stabs. Graham. Things may look bad, but she's got this under control. Or not. Miriam keeps a vigil at the hospital, so Kylie pulls herself together and cleans up at home. Amos, however, is still intent on collecting evidence, and goes back for the plate. While taking pictures of old newspapers reporting on the murder, we see he has a surprise visitor. Amos is confronted as he leaves, and we find out Cragland is actually a pretty chill guy. He's feeling talkative, so he lets Amos know who he favors as a murder suspect. He explains that he once took in a young lady and her son to live with him for a while. The child was unusual, didn't talk, kept to himself, liked to make things out of other things, and preferred tight spaces. When Cragland had to discipline him for taking apart and reassembling 
an animal, he ran off. This was about a year before the murder, which is a long time, but he doesn't think it likely that Eugene went very far, and emphasizes this point for Amos by showing him his old room. Cozy! Amos calls Kylie to discuss this new info, but she's busy putting away the vacuum. In the process, she manages to knock out the back of the closet, revealing a passage to the interior of the house. While thinking of his next steps, Timmy Rooksband comes back to life and gives Amos instructions on how to record on his tape. The light bulb goes off, and Amos hears young Kylie playing with an imaginary friend. No, if you tell me your name. Who then speaks? This is interspersed with scenes of Kylie progressing through the interior of the house, arriving at Eugene's hovel and finding him there. They don't kick things off on a positive foot, and Kylie scratches and claws her way through the walls until she sees an opening and takes it, causing her to burst through the pantry and into the kitchen. She dips the frick out of there, hot wiring a car and speeding to the police department. She gives a breathless account of what happened to the officer, who doesn't seem to take it seriously. Okay, put vacuum cleaner back in cupboard. And the rest is a blur, what'd you say? Hey, respect the badge. He two-finger pecks his way through the report as Amos, utilizing the tracker, races to meet her. He charges into the station to corroborate her story. Meanwhile, Miriam shows up at the house. She finds the mess, but the holes have been covered over. She picks up the rest, so when the police finally show up, everything appears to be in order. Kylie does her best to show them, and when she can't, she tries to convince them. There was never any ghost. Or the noises, the power bills, the stolen food, it was him! This does provide a complete explanation of all the unusual occurrences. Unfortunately for her, they find the weed. So now they know she's a terrible person and a likely liar. Dennis shows up, looking extra oily, ready to dole out therapeutic suggestions. Dennis pushes hard at the crazy door, trying to explain everything that's happened in terms of mental disorder. Fed up, Kylie takes one last go at convincing everyone by running into the kitchen and ripping out the drywall. But the gambit doesn't pay off. Eugene is too good at covering his tracks. Needing a way to explain all of these occurrences, Along with the voice on the tape, Dennis diagnoses dissociative personality disorder. The group starts a discussion about having Kylie committed to an institution to keep her supervised and consistently medicated. As they attempt to broach the topic with her, Dennis bites hard on a tasty treat and almost cracks his tooth. In the process, and in defiance of proper tea time decorum, he removes his partial, revealing that he too has a dental plate, the dirty freak. Kylie feigns cooperation to lower their guard and gets her mom to join her in the hallway. She tells her what she suspects and enlists her help to keep men occupied so she has time to look for evidence. Miriam immediately dives into a conversation of maximum inanity. No, you wouldn't. I mean, that's the thing about buffets. It's all the young kids. I mean, sure, it's a great place to throw birthday parties, but I wouldn't want your six-year-old's fist in my creme brulee, thanks very much. As she does this, Kylie finds an early incident report for Sunshine Grove that shows Dennis was there as a student. He was pummeled on his first day by a 15-year-old girl. Downstairs, Miriam pushes Dennis to the limits of his facade. Lucas. Miriam! Miriam, charged with the task of keeping them both in the living room, ends up downstairs with Kylie. She contends that she had to let Dennis leave to use the bathroom. When they return, the officer is gone and the bathroom is empty. The ladies go upstairs where they find Dennis leaving the bathroom, sweaty and flushed. He claims he was upstairs to be discreet, while they try to play it cool. Both sides of the conversation sense the other is lying. Fed up, Kylie hits him with the facts. First day on the job, you get the shit kicked out of you by a 15-year-old girl, that kind of being fun. They have a brief scuffle involving cheese graters and laundry baskets, and the ladies end up in the bathroom with the dead officer. They do their best to commandeer a weapon or send a signal, but end up getting out of there thanks to Eugene, but not completely unscathed. They get to a safe place, and then Amos shows up. Dennis claims that Eugene is the killer to elicit his help, but then knocks him out at the first opportunity. As Dennis tries to find his way into the walls, the rest of them find themselves in Eugene's lair. Kylie's phone has been Eugenized, so now it just turns on the microwave. They look through some artwork that shows Eugene has been part of the family the whole time, having been present for all of their major life milestones. In a bid to help, he shows them his prime hiding spot, but it doesn't work. Dennis busts through the wall like the Kool-Aid man, but is immediately chamber-potted. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. They have a brief pursuit on the roof that ends with Dennis falling onto the patio furniture below. But that's not the end of it. He shows up again right when they think it's over. As Dennis goes to work, Eugene tags in with a nice stabbing implement. Kylie obliges and forks Dennis big time by way of the chin. It turns out that the fork has been Eugenized as well. Eugene hits the fuses, flips the switch, and pops Dennis's head like a soggy balloon. Seven months later, Kylie has completed her rehab, Graham is on the mend, and everyone appears to be getting along well. We even get indication that Eugene has been formally integrated into the family. It can't just turn off by itself, you must have pressed something. No, I didn't. I didn't press anything. Is the battery flat? Well, it shouldn't be. It's been on the charger all night. Eugene! And with that, we conclude Housebound, an incredibly well-made, charming ghost story with a twist that doesn't rely solely on the twist. It's more like a diversion for the plot. It comes early, it fits all the details, and it doesn't feel cheap or gimmicky. You should give it a try when you get a chance. I hope you enjoyed this summary. Thank you for watching.